Hello, my friend, and welcome to another episode of the Influential Nonprofit. I'm your host, Mary Ann Dersch. I work with nonprofit leaders to grow their influence so they can raise more money without feeling rejected or pushy. And by influence, I mean getting people you have no authority over to do what you want them to do. And in this episode, I want to share with you a little bit about growing your empathy and how it relates to both interpersonal situations and external, more public situations. So I've been doing marketing and communications with nonprofits since 1992. And throughout that time, off and on, I have managed crisis PR situations or not having a crisis. That would be most of my job, right? I don't want people to have a crisis. Yeah. Um, And then sometimes stuff happens and people do things and we need to deal with the consequences. Same for us in our everyday life. Sometimes we do things and we need to deal with the consequences. And part of influence is empathy. And by empathy, I mean really setting aside your agenda, whatever you think or feel, and tapping into what someone else is thinking or feeling, allowing them to be really seen and heard and understood, and that they value and that their feelings value and that their opinion matters. This is important in your day-to-day relationships, and this is important in crisis PR. Because in crisis PR, if you do not empathize and validate someone, they will just keep coming back stronger and stronger than ever because they will come back until they feel seen and heard. And I want to tell you the ability to empathize, the ability to validate someone else, it, it really, it's like a super highway. It just clears away the blocks and allows you to really move past things. It just makes stuff go away my old job, that was part of the value that I brought when, you know, as I, when I worked as like a consultant and strategist was Marianne, make it go away. There would be a dispute or a problem. Even if I wasn't even on that project, I would follow up with the person and say, what's going on. I didn't, I had some natural um, empathy and influence, uh, influential ability that came to me very easily Sometimes when stuff comes to you really easily, you don't value it because you didn't work for it. You didn't try to get it, but this is just a superpower of mine. And when I realized how important influence was and the ability to fundraise and the ability to market, ability to have a good board, ability to have a good supportive community around your work, around you and your whole life anyway, um, is to have influence. I really took a look and said, okay, what do I do to do this? And how can I teach other people to do it? And part of that is empathy. And here's the thing, as a society, we're not very good at empathy. Um, You know, we tend to have sympathy, which is like, um, oh, you know, like sympathy. um, You know, if I would say, um, I feel so sad and you may say, oh, don't be sad. Or what do you have to be sad about? Or, you know, when I'm sad, I go for a run. That's sympathy. Empathy is tell me why you're sad, what's going on, without giving advice, without trying to solve it or fix it for anybody, just witnessing and validating what is going on with someone. And that works so well for you interpersonally, and it works so well in crisis PR, as far as just making stuff go away, minimizing the damage, and allowing you to then restore trust in a relationship and move forward. So I'm going to give you three examples, two that aren't really great. And one that is of how to uh, um, empathize, validate, and apologize and move through a difficult situation. Now, the first thing I want to show you, it's a couple years old um, and it is awkward. <laughs> okay, so just, just bear with me. Cause like th- th- this is, this is cringy. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny it. This is, this is cringy. Um, this is a clip from uh 2019 you can see it's around christmas and um i'm just gonna i'm just gonna let you watch it for a second i didn't even know you wanted to be invited well who doesn't want to be invited to a party well i didn't even know you liked me (laughs) (laughs) of course i like you you knew i liked you you've been on the show many times and and don't i show like (laughs) yeah but i did invite you and you didn't come so this time you invited me? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. How do you know? I don't think so. Ask everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Jonathan, your producer. Who okay. said you were? I yeah, was invited. Why didn't I go? I don't know. <laughs> was it? Was it? it oh yeah, I had that thing. Um, 
<laughs> it was probably in Malibu. That's too far for me to go to. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. No, I think I do remember I was invited. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, no, but I, I really didn't remember that until just now. That is a very awkward conversation <laughs> between Dakota Johnson and Ellen DeGeneres. Now, in that, do you feel like Dakota felt seen and heard? Do you feel like Dakota felt like her feelings and experiences were valid or validated by Ellen? No, no. Ellen screwed up. Um, she made a big stink about not getting invited to her last birthday party. So Dakota made sure she was invited to this birthday party. Somehow it missed her. And that very cringy um, um, conversation happened where they're literally kind of arguing about whether they, they like each other or not. I don't really think they do. Um, and I felt like that was pretty apparent, the tension. So why do I share this with you? Because that is an example of not feeling seen and heard. So what could have be, been done in the opposite? So let's say I'm Dakota and, I, and, and oh, here, here's what I want to say too is Dakota's not stupid and she is, grew up in the spotlight and she at some point knew that like when you're on a talk show, those topics are all done in advance. It, there's nothing that's kind of like made up in the moment. They they walk through exactly what the questions are going to be asked and like what they want to talk about. Um, at the most, they may have a range of topics, but typically what's being asked has already been vetted. So Ellen rolled in, she opened the door. She said, Hey, I heard it was your birthday. I didn't get invited. Like she stepped in it without knowing it. And now, now I, I do believe that Dakota probably knew that Ellen was going to ask her because these topics are vetted in advance and saw this as an opening because she could have done this privately. She could have done this off screen. She could have not even mentioned that she invited Ellen, but she wanted to put her on the spot. And that's kind of what made it awkward because I think Ellen felt a little trapped and she really didn't handle it well. And I completely understand because when stuff happens to us, like, like that, like when somebody says something to you and it's like, you're caught off guard or you, it feels inappropriate or you don't know how to respond, your body goes into defense mode. It goes into your amygdala where you're, you know, your, your fight or flight, the instinct part of the back of your brain. If you can feel a comment in your body or your, your chest beats, you know, your, your chest pounds, you sweat, you can feel the tears in your eyes, your, your head, you know, um, pounds, your stomach, your stomach drops, something like that. Like if you can feel that, that means you have lost the ability for rational thought. That's why it's so important to like practice these skills. That's why I teach these skills. That's why I have programs where people really practice these skills over and over because when in the heat of the moment, you can be ready to respond and you can manage yourself like that self-aware conscious leader can manage yourself through that situation, even through it feeling awkward, even through like your heart pounding, or you sweating a little bit or something, because you're going to have the tools to be able to address it. So what would I do if I was Ellen? Ellen and Dakota said to me, I did, I invited you like, and what if she said this? Oh my God, you invited me to your party and I missed it. I am, I am so sorry. How, wow. I, I had no idea. Hey, producer guy, did I miss that? Yeah, you were out of time. Oh my goodness. I, I, I made a big stink of it last year. I said, and I would say, you must think that I'm not a great person right now because I know I made a stink about not coming to your party before. And then you invited me this time and I didn't show and I ignored the invitation and I can see that you might be upset with me and I completely understand. And I promise you moving forward, I really do cherish you as a person. We've had a longstanding professional and personal relationship and any invitation you give me from now into the future, we treat it with gratitude and respect whether I can attend or not. Now, now, what do you think? Dakota's got no place to go with that, right? She's got nothing like, um, okay, because I did three things that are important. One, I admitted what I did wrong. I said, I missed it and I am sorry. I took full responsibility for, you know, and I'm, I'm being Ellen Hill. Me as Ellen took full responsibility. I am so sorry that happened. I did miss it and I take full responsibility for not missing that. I'm not gonna blame it on my team. I'm not gonna blame it on the email. I take responsibility and you prep you three, you pledge to do better. And I promise you in the future, any invitation you send me will be received with gratitude and respect. Like 
100%. Now, here's the thing. I know I have to apologize, take full responsibility, and make a promise to do better in the future. Those three things will make most things go away. Because most people don't hear that. They hear denial. They hear deflection. They hear excuses. And they're going to keep going in and keep complaining until they hear what they want to hear. So we all have disputes. We all have altercations. It's fine. It's part of being human. It's part of the mess of life. Like my friend, Megan, she's amazing. And she said to me, Marianne, you're not messy. Life is life is messy. We have disputes. We have complications. So this is a tool that you can use to really manage that and practice it. And so if you ever think about working with me, having me coach or train you, joining my, my influence course or whatever, these are the things we're going to work on and we're going to practice together. And that's why people join. I have a year long program that people join because we're working on stuff like this so that in the heat of the moment, they can respond more appropriately. Now, let me go into example number two. Example number two is um, now I don't know if I can. Um, and if you're listening um, you can just listen to the dialogue. It's, it, you know, if you're listening to the podcast, um, cause there's video and audio versions of what I'm sharing. So if you're listening to the podcast, but I want to share, this is Matthew Morrison. Um, he was recently fired off. So you think you can dance and, um, with allegations, I, I want you to listen to, to content of, of what he's saying. Against blatantly untrue statements made anonymously, but I have nothing to hide. So in the interest of transparency, I will read to you the one message that I wrote to a dancer on the show. Hey, it's Matthew. If you don't mind, would love to get your number and talk you through some things. The end. I sent this because this dancer and I both share a mutual respect for a choreographer that I've known for over 20 years, and I was trying to help her get a job as a choreographer on the show. It's, it's devastating that we live in this world where gossip rules and people's lives are being thrown around as clickbait. Um, I think this is much bigger than me and this story. Gossip is toxic and it is destroying our society and we need to do better. And in no way do I want this to take away from the show because dance has always been a unifying and healing modality. And I genuinely wish all the contestants and my fellow judges all the best. It's really unfortunate that I have to sit here and defend myself and my family against blatantly untrue statements. Okay, so let's unpack that. Now, <clears throat> I want to remind you that I've read different stats between 70 and 90% of communication is nonverbal, right? We tend to stress about what we say, you know, um, you know, like, are we going to say the right thing? And, and it really has really little to do with what we say. It's, it's the subconscious cues that we are sending out when we, um, when we, when we say things and our brains are so smart and they're picking up all this energy and all this stuff. Right. And so it's something like that doesn't sit right with me. And I really don't know why, because they said all the right things, but there's something off, right? That's what I call the BS meter. The BS meter is the gap between how you really think and feel and what you're saying you know, those non-apology apologies, which what I think this is, it feels a little hollow to me. In my experience, this is just what I'm picking up for this. I would love to know what you think about this, but I'm really fascinated with this whole aspect of communication. Um, there was a lot of things about that as far as like um, his posture, um, how he was sitting, like it's really important, even how I have my computer here. I, so you can see my hands. It's important to see people's hands because you're more trustworthy. If you ever have an interview or something, make sure people can see your hands because if your hands are missing, like, I don't know why it's just something, just do it anyway. So you can see my hands. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see my hands. If you're listening, you know, like you can hear in tone and we have to really think about when we're communicating, how, how, how is our posture? Like sitting up with our head just a little bit forward, an open stance, like the way we hold ourselves, the energy, the, like if, if we are feeling resentful, but our brain, our mouth is saying, I'm so sorry, with people who hear that their BS meter will go off. So let's unpack this apology. Now, I'm gonna say that, and this is, just what I think. I'm not quite sure. I believe that he got canned off a TV show 
for one tweet. I don't, or one text. I don't really buy that. That's me. I just don't feel like, I think there was a lot more to it. And I think he's really angry. So he could have two choices here, not say anything, not respond because he's not prepared to respond in a way that will be helpful because he's angry. Um, in this case, I think a non-response would have been all right because he wasn't really ready to admit what had happened. That's how I see it. If he would have said, I behaved inappropriately, I am very sorry that I did that. I take full responsibility for my actions and I promise to you know, make sure that I, res that, you know, I respect professional boundaries in the future. And I stand by the decision of So You Think You Can Dance, the producers, to have me leave the show because I, I did do those things. Now, when people step up into that, you've got no play. Oh, okay. They admitted it there. Uh, yeah, I deserve to get canned for that. Oh, all right. But you can see there's a lot of deflection. He's blaming it on the media, on society that we can do this, blah, blah, blah. You're like, okay, he's, he is not taking any accountability. So when you come up there and you say, hey, I just want to say, I didn't do anything. And I blame all of you in the media. People are like, uh-huh, sure, sure. So that's like what not to do. Now I said, step one is take, you know, you have say you're sorry. And step two, take full accountability and responsibility for what you did. And if you don't think you did it, it may be hard to do that. And that's why you kind of get these non-responses like, well, I'm sorry you got offended. No, that's putting, now that's putting the burden on the people on back on them. That's not validating. I'm sorry that upset you. Um, you know, you could, you could make an apology like this. And I'm not sure I love this hundred percent, but I'm going to roll with it. Like it was never my intention to hurt anyone. And I realized now that I did, and I take full responsibility for what happened and how my actions were perceived. If the, the faster you can just take responsibility for what happened, the faster this stuff is going to go away. So let me share with you one more example. I do not have a video of this. I tried very hard to find it. Now, this is something that happened um, um, uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of June. Um, now, I live in St. Louis, so I'm a Cardinals fan, and I'm a Blues fan, and all the fans of things St. Louis. And we were playing the Cubs, and it was Saturday doubleheader, and um, we have a hot young rookie. His name is Brendan Donovan, and he was sensational during this, during this weekend in Chicago. Now, anytime somebody goes, like, jumps on the scene and, and raises, you know, jumps up and, and starts doing really well, somebody's going to want to bring that person down. That's totally, um, reasonable thing, right? Um, when the blues were in the playoffs and there were some inappropriate tweets from Jordan Bennington, the goalie from 10, 10 years ago, those got unearthed by the San Jose reporter, because that's what good reporters do. They dig up dirt. So this was going to happen. Brendan Donovan, this rookie, um, had tweets from 2011 and 2013 that contained some homophobic language and some gay slurs. Now he is, I think, 25 years old. So this was nine and 11 years ago. Obviously he's a gr more grown person. So obvious and it happened, right? It happened. Here's what I think happened. Um, I don't know if he knew about these tweets or had forgotten about them. I don't know if um, they, they, he knew about them, but they were going to wait and to see if anybody found them. Um, the Cardinals is a pretty great organization. And I would imagine they have some pretty good PR people who coach and train up and coming, you know, rookies because um, Donovan was drafted into the Cardinals farm system in 2018. So he's been with the system, with the company for a long time. So I'm thinking that, and if they're smart, they should, and you can come see me Cardinals, if you want some help on this, to coach people on how to manage these things, because he said the perfect freaking response. And I want to share with you what his response was, because it's so good. And when I heard it, I was like, yes, this is how you do it. So whether he's really good at this himself, or he's really well coached, it doesn't matter. This is where it went. <clears throat> he says, um, um, so 
let me, before I read this, let me say this. This came to light during a doubleheader because it's a long day. I think the first game started at 11 something and the second game was at six. So in between this or during the second game, um, they, these tweets came to light and now it's on Twitter and people are talking about it. So at the end of the game, a game that he played really, really well in at the end of the game press conference, they said, hey, there's these tweets and here's what he said. He said, I take full responsibility. It was something I sent out a long time ago. I am truly sorry to anyone I may offended. Anyone that knows me as a person knows I see everyone the same and I do not condone that type of behavior or anything. But if I offended you, I am truly apologize. Hopefully I can do my part to show you that's not who I am. You go, Brendan. He didn't blame it on the media. He didn't say it was a long time ago and I'm a different person, you know, and, you sh- and it's not even relevant anymore. He's like, I am truly sorry that I said those things, period. Now, the only thing I would tweak, because y'all know I got to tweak something, is when he says um, that I see everyone the same. Seeing everyone the same, that's not really how we see people. I think what he wants to say is he accepts everyone for who they are, Um, which is different than seeing everyone the same. I I would just take that out. Here's the statement. I know it's editing, (laughs) editing 2020 hindsight, right? But I would just say, it was something I sent out a long time ago. I'm truly sorry to anyone I may have offended. Anyone that knows me knows um, that I do not condone that type of behavior. And that, but he used the magic formula. And so that's the perfect thing is that he used the form. He took full responsibility. He said he was sorry. He took full responsibility for his actions. And he said he was going to do better in the future. He didn't blame it on anybody else. He didn't deflect, deflect it. He just sat there. And after that, there's really not a lot you can do with that, except move on. Um, He had a, there was, I mean, I don't, there was some, you know, a little bit of backlash and, and I mean, I don't want to say backlash. That's not even the word I want to use. There's a little bit of clickbait around this, you know, like the woke mob cancels Brendan Donovan, blah, blah, blah. But I don't even know what those things are. He, he got caught. It happened a really long time ago. Um, he, he apologized. He didn't, he didn't dismiss, deflect or deny it. And that is the most important thing. You can't dismiss, deflect or deny because then that person or that institution or whoever it is will just be coming back and coming back until you actually validate them for who they are. And so when I talk about managing objections, when I talk about um, you know, empathy and really put, putting aside your agenda and just tapping into where people are at. This is, this is what I'm talking about. If a donor comes to you and they're upset about something and you say, oh, I fixed that already or, or, or oh no, that's not the case. You know, hey, we really, um, I, I don't really understand um, or I'm not getting communicated with enough. I, I, I send you stuff every week. I'm not getting communicated enough. Oh, wow. Okay, well, tell me what's going on. Right, because that second phrase, I communicate every week, that's a deflection, a dismissal, a denial. So just leaning into the objection allows it to go away. And if you can do that, you will be a master influencer telling you it's like a super highway through the world. Things just melt away and disappear and you navigate conflict so much more effectively. So just remember the magic formula, okay? The magic formula is say you're sorry, Take full responsibility and accountability for what happened and promise to do better in the future. There's really not, not much more that, that, that you can do for that. And, oh, well, and, and mean it, <laughs> right? Because if you don't mean it, because I don't think Matthew meant it, you don't mean it, it's going to come across that way. So you have to do your work and do your reflection to put yourself in a position to understand that this happened. And although you may not see it the way they do, you validate their opinion. And that's the thing with empathy. We want to be able to agree like, well, I don't agree with that. It doesn't matter if you agree with it or not. You say, I see that this hurt you and I am sorry. And I will do better. And that's it. And then you learn from it and you move on. Uh, I have a crisis PR guide. It's called a nonprofit crisis communications guide. I'm going to pop it into the link into the show notes for this episode. Um, I have two books. One, I don't, I don't give this out a lot. And I just thought this would be the perfect opportunity for you guys to have this. Um, is um, I, It's called, Oh Crap, That Just Happened. And it's how to navigate um, 
uh, a, a crisis. And the other one is called, um, um, it, the other one is sort of just, uh, uh, there's two books. One is like, oh crap, that just happened. And it's, and it's really a guidebook. And the other one is really how to navigate your own emotions and your own feelings and guide people through a crisis. And I'm just, um, I'm going to put that little link in the show notes and the YouTube and in the podcast. So you guys can grab that and download that. Um, and, you know, just tuck that away. And if something happens and you're like, oh crap, that just happened. You know where to go for help. All right, guys, that's it for me in this episode of the Influential Nonprofit. Um, remember to use your influence and validate, empathize, and see people who they truly are and see how better your life and your work become.